Um, the next piece, um, I'm happy to say, is being brought us by um, Dr. Denise. Now, <laughs> I'm going to say Laj Madir. There we are. I, I keep having wanting to pronounce it as a French name, but I do. La Gimaudière <laughs> is an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe from Belcor, North Dakota. She's invo been involved with education for more than 44 years as an elementary school teacher and a principal earning her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from the University of North Dakota. Um, she currently works as an associate professor in the educational leadership program at North Dakota State University. I'm particularly happy for her to be here as one of the original founders and the past president of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition of which you heard in the previous presentation. And to meld pieces that were brought to us in the first presentation this morning as Mark was ending, talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, historical trauma, and pits. Um, the concept that these injuries were in the past is something that we need to put out of our minds. The past is not only prologue, and it's not just history. It is present injuries suffered today in Indian country, if I can use that term, by Native peoples because of all of the cumulative effects of constant disruption of family life, connection with land, connection with their language, the erase, erasures, assimilation, the allotment program of the Dawes Act, anything to separate Indian people from each other, the critical elements of family and the village of the, of the community that raises children has been disrupted. And that disruption itself then plays itself out. So we're trying to recognize it one of the ways of saying, oh, well, that was in the past. That is not true. And so to learn a little bit more about how this, these actions continue to have repercussions in the present and where, where those are showing up is what Denise has set herself out to tell us about today. And we're so glad to welcome her from Dakota Territory. Thank you so much. Buju Anin, Wabishka Bene Sawanakwat, Ikwe de Jinakaz, Ashijak Nido Dame, Mikanakwa Jun and Dunjiba, Niman Wendam, Oma Ayan. I greeted you in our Ojibwe language. Uh, I greeted you not as friends, but as relatives. We are all related. Um, thank the Creator for the beauty of this day, for the warmth and the beauty of this day, and thanked all of you for being here today. When we say bonjour, a lot of people think we're saying bonjour, the French, and that's not correct. Uh, we have a sacred being called Nana Buju, so when I say Buju to you, I'm greeting you as a sacred people. So I do need to give a trigger warning, especially to Native people, but also to those of you that may have been molested or traumatized or beaten um, in your lives, that this can, there's, um, this can be pretty rough, um, what we're going to show. This research is my research that I did as a uh, professor, but my interest, this is, this is, this is a, a young relative that did this. She happened to do this painting, and, and I named my book, my, my poetry book uh, about boarding schools, uh, Bitter Tears, and she happened to have this picture, this painting, uh, and it call, it's called Boarding School After, After Morning, so it's pretty cool, so that worked out really well. 
So I dedicate this to my parents, and my interest in boarding school research began before I was a professor. I interviewed my father before he passed away, and my mom died when she was 47 in 1977, so I didn't get a chance to visit with her as much or as, as often as I did, I did my father, but that's where my interest grew. So this is my mom on the right-hand side. I just recently found her records of the boarding school that she went to. Uh, and uh, so she went to Wapton, and she also went to Stavan, but uh, I haven't been able to find any other records of her at boarding school, just, just one letter, and she ran away from, uh, from one of the boarding schools. Like, yeah, go, Mom. No. So I'm not sure what, sc what, what school this is. It looks like the older one, probably uh, Wapton. This is my father. He went to Chamawa. Now, those of you that have the packet read my, my healing journey, uh, mostly about my journey to you know, just deal with my father and his, his boarding school trauma. So this is when he was sent to Chamawa, and it was in 1925. So he was sent three days and three nights. Didn't speak a word of English. He was literally a stolen generation, but we'll talk more about that. So I'm so glad that the two previous speakers have talked about the whole 500 years of history <laughs> that you're getting in one day because I don't go over the history, so I, I'm glad that you're, you're aware of Grant's uh, peace policy and so on. So Pratt actually liked Indians, uh, Captain Richard Pratt, and he, you know, he worked with the Native people, the Indian uh, prisoners down in in Florida and wanted to do an experiment to see if they could learn and if they could do jobs and so on. <clears throat> but he hated the culture, and that's what he wanted to kill. So we had two choices, either be educated or killed. The government said it cost a million dollars for every campaign against Native peoples to kill us. So they said, we got to do something a little cheaper. So Carlisle is just a couple hours away. How many have been to Carlisle? Oh, yeah, right. I was thinking we should go on a field trip there Sunday. <laughs> Some of you had, haven't been there. I just went there last year. Uh, I've been to Chamawa out in Oregon. So Richard Pratt established Carlisle, and then his buddy, Wilkinson, said they were both in the Civil War together. Let me start a school on the, on the West Coast. So he sent uh, Wilkinson out in 1880 then to start Chamawa, and that's where my father was sent in 1925. And I have a map. I've, I've put copies out there. Everyone's welcome to a copy. I have a map. Uh, it's been 10 years of my life finding the boarding schools in the United States. No one has ever asked the churches. No one had ever asked the Quakers. No one had ever asked the government, how many boarding schools did you have? So I, when I, I went up to the Truth and Reconciliation, I worked with the commissioners. I was invited up to Whitehorse, Yukon, to witness as an international witness their healing of when they had uh, boarding school survivors come in and, and speak about their experiences in the residential schools there. And Chief Justice Murray looked at me across the table at dinner time, and he said, well, how many boarding schools do you have in the United States? Couldn't tell him. So I've set it my life's goal to find boarding schools, and someone just emailed me another boarding school, another researcher. So, so far there's 359, there's 358 here. So this map is nowhere else. Uh, it's on the Boarding School Healing Coalition, but it's, it only has 332. I've done a lot of research since they've published that one. So we're still finding, still finding uh, boarding schools and mission schools, and it's, it's a difficult and tedious and, and a, a tough project, but I will never stop doing boarding school research. Kind of an interesting story about uh, Wilkinson is that he was, he was so I don't know what I, I call him, like foaming at the mouth Christian. <laughs> he was just, <laughs> and they, they couldn't even take him in the army. They just said, you can't do that. So they fired him from the school. They put him back in the army as a captain. They sent him over to Minnesota. And the last, one of the last battles in the United States was with the Ojibwe people, and he was killed in that battle by, by my people. <laughs> it's like, hmm. So that's an interest. And I just found that through research. I had no idea. So that was pretty cool. So my father, they literally came and snatched him in 1925. He was being raised by 
uh, an old Cree couple because his mother had died in 1918 flu epidemic. So grandpa couldn't take care of the, the two kids. Uh, so what was interesting, what I found when I was looking at his, I went to uh, the federal archives in Sandpoint, Seattle, and got his boarding school records. And when I look at all of my family's records that I found through the different archives, is that there's one handwriting through all of them. There's not, my grandfather didn't sign for my, my father to go. Someone signed for him, because he probably didn't write, well, well, he went to boarding school too. I'll show a picture of him in a bit. But someone signed for these people. So even though the government at this point in the 20s had said, you, you, you can't just go and steal them, they still did. And someone still signed for, for them to go. So what I'm going to do is, because most of the people I interviewed, they had never told anyone their stories. They remained silent. Even 75, my auntie was 90 years old, uncle 95. I'm going to let you read the, read the I'm not going to read the slides. This is my father. So he was nine years old, didn't speak a word of English, and what... The elders, you know, the, the people that raised him, they'd say, Pimbasta, Nushishim, run, my grandchild, and they'd hide him in the bush so the agents couldn't find him. But they threatened him after Grandpa signed, they threatened them with, of course, jail and uh, holding their rations and even their wood. And, you know, North Dakota has 80 below zero wind chill winters that they would have died. So I just can't imagine him being pulled away from this elder couple that loved him dearly. So as young as I found younger, even than the Haskell babies, four years old, there's young kids as young as two years old that were taken, uh, stolen, and, and put into boarding schools. This hangs in, in Haskell. I, I went down there to tour the, the cemetery. So this is one I just found recently. This is Little Flower School. That's in Fort Taunton, which is about 90 miles from, this is where my dad, uh, Fort Taunton, Federal boarding school is just a few miles from Little Flower boarding school. The Catholic nuns, there was no separation of church and state. The Catholic nuns still taught at the federal boarding school. But this, the back of this shows that this little Indian boy is telling this little Indian boy, and this is just, you know, 1930s or 40s or whatever. They didn't really dress like that by then, how to behave and how to act at boarding school. So I just, it's just kind of a cute but very sad, sad little picture. So we all know of the Carlisle picture like this. And I was just talking to Lou, it's like there's so much information about Carlisle and things are digitalized. Well, there's 359 other boarding schools that all have pictures like this of these babies, these little Indian kids at, at boarding school. And this again is in Fort Taunton. And even, even though the tribe was right there in Fort Taunton, these kids could not go home at night and they didn't go home during the entire year. They went home in the summer even though they could see their house right over there. This is Chimawa, so this is Papa said that's what his uniform he wore. This is just before he, this is in like 1915 or so. But those boots and stuff, he remembers those lace-up boots and uh, army, army cloth, I mean army wool uniforms and so on. He said they were itchy and miserable. This is the entrance that he would have gone through. Three days and three nights on the train. Didn't speak a word of English, got slapped up whenever he spoke in English by the, the matron that was bringing them. So even though I'm talking more about just recent years, a lot of the, the people I interviewed said they, their parents, if they knew they were going off to boarding school, would make little cute little dresses or dress, the, dress them up nice. Those were still burned when, when they hit the boarding school, and they were giving what's called GI clothing, government issue clothing. This is Grandpa Ben and his sister Martha, and this was uh, 1898, and this is Fort Taunton. You can see the, barely see the bricks in the back, but it, when you go to Fort Taunton and you go to Carlisle, they're exactly the same. It's, but uh, it's, yeah, it's interesting. So someone in Fort Taunton found these stuffed in the eaves of the windows, um, wool, and they're tiny. And at first I thought, how did the army make such tiny little army? Well, they, the girls learned how to sew. They had to sew all their outfits and sew the boys' outfits also. So, but the, and... They let me go places 
as a researcher and a poet that they don't let tourists go. And uh, so I've written some, some poems I'll read about Fort Taunton. My, grand, uh, my grandfather, too. My mother's father is also went there. Our, you know, Indian way, you have a grandfather and all their brothers are also your grandfathers. So this is my auntie. Up in Canada, not, I haven't seen it here, but up in Canada, they would just say, hey, 76, get over here. They wouldn't call you by your name. It's my father. Now, I went down to Chamao and I went to the cemetery one year, and then I came back just, just recently in there, and the cemetery looked very different. The first time it was very disheveled, it wasn't taken care of. This time there was a, a gentleman there with a dog and a, he had a big orange bucket and he was taking care of it. He had um, mowed around, he had mowed it and it was just pretty. He made it look nice and taken care of. Uh, so I got to talking to him. His mom had been sent from, she was Yurok and Yurok from Northern California had been sent there. But he said these, wood, these rifles, his father worked there, were buried underground. They dug a hole by Chamawa School and they dug a hole and they put all the wooden rifles and, and the rifles in that hole. So I know where they're buried. And then the original cemetery cement uh, headstones for the students, those are also taken off and, and put into that pit. And they've, it's smoothed over and now the Indian Health Service has a little picnic table on, on top of where they're buried. I would love to unbury them. Uh, so. Yeah, so he, they had to march, little tiny, little tiny. And Dad said, you couldn't even move your eyes side to side or you got bopped upside the head and um, marching. So what they did then is they put little flat plaques with, I'll show a picture of probably so it would be easier to mow. And I'll tell you another story later about that. So this is, this is another school. I can't remember which school this is. It might be Chamawa. But that's Captain Pratt's influence is uh, the Army type of discipline. You know, they had, they had muster, they had revelry, of course, in 1925, and bells and whistles for everything, to stand there, to sit down, and everything they did was, their, their whole day was extremely regimented. We all know what DDT does, too. So some of the people that are interviewed did not want their names, their original names, so I've given them, what do you call it, pseudonyms? Because they didn't want their family to know that they had been talking to me, and, and many of them said, because after I transcribe your interview, I send it back to you, and you can erase or redact or add anything you want. Two of the women said, I, my kids don't know about this, and my grandkids, just my husband, I don't ever want them to know what I went through then suffer every day. I don't want them to have to suffer. Sort of like Holocaust survivors too. Uh, many of them didn't tell anything about the Holocaust to their children. So it was the same, same reaction. So, some, so but my Annie, Auntie Annie, I, she let me use her name. Well, she's passed away now. Papa interviewed him before. He was the first one I interviewed. But he, you know, I didn't see scars on his back. But by God, if he said he had scars, he has scars. I did a qualitative study when I interviewed them. You know, as a professor, you have to publish or perish. So, uh, so you themes bubble up from what uh, the people. They're just everyone. They're not my participants. They became like my relatives. So one of the big, oh, the four themes. One was uh, was loss. So there's loss of identity, language, culture, ceremonies, traditions, loss of self-esteem. Loneliness due to loss of parents and extended family, feeling of abandonment by parents, feeling lost about a place when they returned home. And that happened to my father too. Also severe abuse in the form of corporal punishment, forced child labor, the outing program, hunger, malnourished, sexual and mental abuse. They also experienced unresolved grief, maintaining silence, mental health issues, relationship issues, alcohol abuse, and they said they received a poor education. So those were the themes that um, came out of the study after, after these interviews. Just found this. 
another researcher was researching down in Kansas and sent this to me. So I've got the letters from Fort Totten. So Grandpa Ben was being a stinker, a couple other guys, but they put in the guardhouse with bread and water. This is Fort Totten. It's my mom. So but a lot of kids were locked in closets. A lot of them are still traumatized from being locked in. You know, they pee their pants and then got whipped for that. But she'd go home and grandma would tell her, talk like a human being, you know, talk our tribal language. And then she'd go back to school and the nuns would get her. I had heard about these dungeons from another friend up home whose father said he was thrown in a dungeon because he wouldn't speak English and that he would be thrown down there as pitch black and that he would just sing Sundance songs at the top of his lungs. So I went looking for these dungeons. So there's two of them below the boys' dorm and this one is way in the corner and it's, you know, they're still remodeling some of Fort Taunton, uh, refurbishing it and so on. And this, this was, no tourists can go back here. It's, re it's, really, it's really bad. I, but there, it's a younger, two, uh, younger people that work there, and one's a native female, so they let me, they let me go. But, uh, but so for this story, the, the, the two of them, I had on like a skirt and sandals, like I'm sure, Denise. So I couldn't go down there, but there was a ladder, so I asked them to go down there, and then I would take those two wood things and drop the, the big heavy door, trap door, onto them and see if it was dark down there. So they went down and shut off their lights, and I put that down, and they said, yeah, it's dark down here. <laughs> so, so I knew that was one of them, and the gal made it up the ladder. The guy made it up a couple rungs, and it fell. It, it broke. I had a heart attack. I had to sit down, so oh, no. So he made it all the way up, and he got his arms about here, and the whole ladder collapsed. <laughs> so when I talked to elders, uh, some of the elders that I interviewed for this that from Fort Totten, they said it's probably like the spirits of the boys wanted to keep keep that man, keep him there. He was injured, but he got out okay, but we didn't report it to the state or anything. <laughs> but this is just a sad, this is sad. And I, I want to find out what these, these underground places were for, because there was root cellars, we know where those at, but so when you go up to the boys' stairs, there's also a dungeon there that they were thrown down. They know that. And so, but Oliver, and he wouldn't come with me to the fort. He's too, still too traumatized. He's in his 70s to even go to the fort. But he said, you stand in the boys' dorm, you look across Calvary Square, and there's another dungeon and a building there. So we went looking for that one. So we found it. And we, um, I, I went down in this one because was, it was pretty shallow. One of the other Native men that was, uh, he's a young guy, a little skinny young guy. He went crawling around because they have since put water pipes and so on because they did use it for a regular school. And he found this orange marble. So I've written a poem, of course, about it, wondering if that marble wasn't, wasn't Oliver's marble. This is a boy's dorm, and I like this picture, only in that you can see way down there. And all of these doors and had, they were originally for the cavalry. You know, the 7th Cavalry was there, wasn't it? Custer was there before they went on down. I had a poem about that, too, before he went on down to, to where his last stand was. But it's just so sad. I mean, I think it, and it's cold. It's just cold, cold, cold. There's just the one pane windows. They, I don't know how these kids kept warm. This is a refurbished area that they show the, go the girls' dorm is completely still destroyed. But it shows they certainly didn't have blankets that nice either. <laughs> nice down comforter, no. It was just the ugly uh, wool blanket. So, but it shows how close they were. The nuns made them sleep with their arms over there chest because you can't touch the other the other beds so and they also had to sleep on the black on their backs because who knows what would happen if you slept on your stomach oh, it's weird so that's um, Fort Taunton just recently also even though they've been working there and I've been there for I don't know how many times they the, in the science lab it's all dusty and everything the ceiling's falling down but they found a paper bag and in that paper bag they found a seminal engine jawbone so the theory is that probably some lieutenant or somebody brought it up from another war with the Seminoles. We have since contacted the repatriation people 
and they're in the process of repatriating that to the to their tribe. So yeah, that just looks the same thing as they've repainted. The bricks are all crumbly. They they made the, the bricks out of clay from North Dakota, but it's all it's not good from you know the 1800s when they built it. So they keep painting and painting over it, but it's. Uh, So there's just corporal punishment. And yeah, the, someone said, well, you know, there was corporal punishment all over. And there was. But at least when, when the teachers or the nuns hit you and pulled your hair or your ears, that you could go home and tell someone. There was no oversight in these boarding schools at all for the beatings. And, and kids were killed. My father watched a Blackfeet boy. And it's in my story. He watched a Blackfeet boy go through that gauntlet. And if you, if you let up and hit your friend easy, then you would have to take your friend's place. So that made sure that everyone got whacked pretty horribly. And his kidneys ruptured. So then I say in my, in my work and in my poetry and so on, did my father, because he went into carpentry, did he have to build a casket for that little boy? Or was he one of them that had to hit him? And part of, maybe felt part of that he killed this little boy, plus had to build a casket. Cause my father didn't do very good in his old, older life. Go military. Now, this is my friend, and I told him, I said, can you show me how you were made to kneel on a broomstick? Well, he, he wouldn't do the broomstick. But he put it, he knelt against a corner, and they, I mean, a, a wall, and drew it. So it's not like you're out. Just kneel. They had to kneel against the wall and stick their nose in it if they move their nose. And, and he's about eight years younger than me, but he still has, he has trouble with his knees this day. But mom knelt on a, on a broomstick also with, with the nuns. And we were disciplined the way my parents were disciplined. So when us girls got in trouble, she'd yell at us, you girls get to your corner. So we had to kneel in the corner, um, not with our nose stuck to the corner. We had to kneel in the corner for like 30 minutes at a time. This is my grandfather. This is my mom's dad. I'll read you the poem that I wrote about Grandpa's story. So this is, my grandfather was a new initiate. <clears throat> my grandfather was a new initiate at the Fort Taunton Indian Boarding School. He was told he had to steal a can of tomatoes, a sweet fruit to these hungry little boys in the dorm, down the cement stairs, past the headmaster's studio with its own bath, into the Dakota dark. He stumbled across Calvary Square, to the outside kitchen shed door, fumbled for the hanging string down the narrow stairs, grabbed the heavy can and lit out into the steel arm of the headmaster. They brought me to the magazine room where a barrel was strung across. I had to lay over it and two bigger boys held my arms. The little boys had to watch. The headmaster whipped my bare back with the rubber hose. <gasps> I couldn't breathe, couldn't catch my breath. I passed out. At Fort Taunton today, the red bricks crumble beneath white paint. Name plaques on the buildings recognize its days as a fort and then a boarding school. Standing inside the black powder flower storage room, it's small, maybe 10 by 10. How did all the little boys fit in? As I stood and wept, the hot July winds gathered forces from across the plains and hurled like warriors into the square and arrows soaked in gunpowder lit aimed and the room exploded around me, the bricks a liquid red. It's my uncle. I asked him, I said, Uncle, how come the nuns were so mean? And he said, because they didn't do nothing until they asked the devil first. I wouldn't, I stopped the interview. He's had heart attacks and he started getting angry. So that's that unresolved grief, unresolved, um, that soul wound. Trachoma was a big one. Tuberculosis, Fort Taunton, after it was closed, uh, it turned into a preventorium for little Indian kids, for the kids that had TB. So you can see where the way they slept, how things would whip through pretty fast. 
Canada has records of the priests saying, put the kids with tuberculosis back in the classroom. So there's a Marsha Small doing, a, she did her master's, and she did a G, ground penetrating a GPR of the Chamawa Cemetery. And she said that there are more than 220 bodies because she, the bodies are buried on top of bodies. And then around the edge, she found more, more graves. They're unmarked then, but most of these are marked. Just found this out this past year. Interviewed uh, Eugene Chase. He let me use his, his name. I was just talking to, with Lou. How many of these across the United States? There's 359 boarding schools that most of them have cemeteries. How many kids are, uh, we don't know their names, we don't know their tribes. We figured maybe these kids were from Canada. They were never returned home. There's no records, Fort Taunton, mm, Blue Cloud Abbey. The priests are wary when I come around asking for information. They, I've gone all over and I cannot find any records of Fort Taunton boarding school of when the kids died or where they were buried or if they were sent home or letters. Need to do some more research at the National Archives or at Marquette. But the, um, if I go there now, it, they'll show me where these, because he said they're little, little humps. You can, you can still see them buried outside the Catholic Church. And so this is, this is Chamawa. This is what the, the kids did. Either the Boy Scouts or the the kids themselves made these new flat, flattened ones. This is going to be on the cover of a book. I have a, a book that has all of this in it uh, and 15 of the interviews I've done called, it's going to be called Stringing Rosaries because the, the kids at one of the schools, I don't even think it was a Catholic, maybe Marty, but they, they had to string rosaries perfectly, you know, with the nuns watching over them with a the big stick and send them out for their begging letters. So this is one of the, the photo that will be on the cover of the, it'll come out on October 2nd if we're, my editor's really good, fast at editing. So the, some of these have never been seen before. They were, I found them in, in Marquette. There's thousands of photos there from the, the Catholic boarding schools alone. So I, I just get kind of tired of the same ones coming out of Carlisle. <laughs> it's like there's, so many other boarding schools. So of course, you know, the, um, Christianity, these poor little Indian boys are learning how to sew, and then the, the government with the American flag. I, oh, this one just makes me sad. I mean, you look at that little guy. He's trying to pull away from the priest. I mean, the, everyone I interviewed was molested. The ones that were most reticent to talk were men. And the, if they weren't molested themselves, they witnessed it. The priests coming to get the boys or the headmasters coming to get the boys. I call Chamberlain Chamber of Horrors still operating, but it's, it's run by a tribe, and they're still Catholic, but it's, it's different now. He wouldn't talk to me at first. He said, I'll never tell my boarding school story. So over dinner with other friends, I happened to mention that most of the time um, men won't speak is because they've been sexually molested. So that gave him permission then to tell me his story. And he's never told anybody in his family except for his wife. This is when I was just walking around Fort Taunton and another elder came by and told me the story. And this is just, you know, a couple boarding schools. The man that I told you was at the boarding school, uh, I mean at the Chamawa graveyard. He said, would you like to come and talk to my mom? She went to Chamawa. She was stolen when she was four years old. There was 12 of them in Europe. They were happy, well taken care of, well fed. 
agent came in and just said, you, you, and you. And what had happened, she said, is that someone, one of the, her brother's sisters yelled, there's a white man in the house, and she hadn't seen a white man. So she went running, and he took her, and the mother was screaming, she's only four years old. But they took her, and they sent her to Chamawa. And this is her introduction to boarding school. This is called secondary trauma, and I didn't sleep that night. I could not sleep after, after interviewing her and hearing this story. There was another story they told of when the boys ran away from Chamawa, there was a beam like this in the cafeteria, so they threw ropes over the beams and tied the boys up by their hands and lifted them up so that their feet weren't touching the floor in front of all the kids eating to, well, it's a way to shame you out or try not to make them run away. So my father built a lot of the buildings in Tumawa. Uh, Fort Totten, the, the girls did all of the laundry, the big mangles, and you know what a mangle is, the big mangles, and kids were injured, kids were killed, killed in the farm, working um, in the barns. And um, So my, my auntie that just passed away, she was, I said, what was your daily schedule like? And she said, oh, on Monday we did laundry, then on Tuesday we were working in the kitchen making bread, and then she said, when were we educated? So this is some of the, the darker ones are what people could use when they went back home. Um, my dad was taught carpentry. He was also taught tinsmithing. Well, when you go home, there's back to the res. Most of these weren't anymore. You couldn't do anything with them anymore. And even farming on our small reservations, you, you couldn't get the banks and the white banks and off reservation towns to give you the money for what you needed to farm. So, but some people did. I was listening to some elders when I did this presentation a few days ago in Rapid City, and they said, my mom, she, did, she learned how to cook, she learned how to sew, she learned how to clean, and, that, and same with my mom. That was all that they were offered, though. They weren't offered to go on to school or to high school or to college. Usually eighth grade was where they cut off your education. Mm -hmm. At Fort Taunton, someone told me that when they worked at Fort Taunton as a little girl, they liked having bakery duty because they got to stay above the bakery and so they could get up early and it was warm and they could steal food if you stole food like like my grandpa you know you got severely punished when one guy said that he could just couldn't wake up in the morning so they built a platform and they put him right by the that big bugle that big bell and he lost his hearing as a little boy this is my auntie yeah, where'd they get classroom time? She just passed away a year ago. So those of you that understand failure to thrive. Common stories. These are stories every, every, you know, this is my story, my family's story, but it's a story of hundreds of thousands of kids that were sent to boarding school. Roger will be one of the chapters of my book. I mean, how sick is that? Uh, everyone I talked to was always hungry. Everyone was hungry. And they tried to steal food. My dad said it wasn't a choice. You went to church or you didn't eat. Common story. Common. Canada, I've heard it over and over again. So even if they had a farm, the dairy, they didn't get fresh food or meat because they sell, sold that to support the school. So again, they would go into town and, and uh, stay with families, mostly during the summer, because they didn't want you to go back home, go back into your language and ceremonies and so on. Uh, and they were also molested, and some kids died. Lou should come up and talk during this conference about what she's, one area of boarding school research that we don't know is these kids died on the outing program. I'm just finding that out. Jeff Grimage, I think someone, I, the, the article's out there, just now hearing that. We know that also schools, when you got sick, 
they would send you home to die. So a lot of these graveyards don't even tell the whole story. So where are those kids? Where are the records about those kids? Where are the records of the kids that died on these outing programs now? So Lou's doing that incredible research. And that's just at one school, Carlisle. There's 385 other schools that. So Bismarck, you know, it's now Frayne Barracks. So I and another professor went down there and said, I gotta go see this boarding school, it's still standing. So um, a gentleman took us on a tour. The neat thing, this says 1916. This is in pencil. It's one of the kids. It's still there. That's so cool. So I was taking pictures just of my iPhone and the, the gentleman saying, I'm so glad it's being recorded. And oh my, I got to get a professional photographer here to, to look at these. When your eyes adjust, there's two little horses. So it's all over the buildings at student height. Wow. Is, are these, this is so cool. So I got to go back. And when I was doing this research, about maybe 10 years ago, came to a realization that another researcher stated that our parents weren't parented. They were beaten, you know, told you're dirty, filthy, savage, beaten the language out of uh, a lot of loss. So we were parented the way my parents were parented in the boarding school. My father had a belt and beaten with, with whips and so on, so that's how he, he disciplined us kids. He said when he went off to the army after Pearl Harbor, so that was a piece of cake compared to the marching and everything that he had to do in boarding school. And you'll hear that a lot from older gentlemen that were boarding schooled. Historical trauma is, is a relatively new that Braveheart um, studied. When you look at the Jewish history, Japanese and other uh, genocides in, in the world, their the descendants are, are in historical trauma. So I thought, oh my God, that's me, that's my family, that's my brother, my sister, that's my dad. So my historical trauma, my great-grandmothers, I remember both of them very well, didn't speak English, but one of them uh, ra grew up and raised my grandfathers in Cannonball, um, North Dakota. And she was a medicine person. She would gather water from the river and put medicine in it, and if it moved in a circle, then that was the medicine for you. So we'd go visit her, and um, so when they flooded Fort Yates the first time, it just devastated her because it flooded her medicines. So, but we have pictures of her, and she's, she's a kind of a tough-looking woman. We hear that she could break a buffalo rib. Um, just, you know, men would have contests in her younger days. And, but we have a, Grandpa has a picture of her, and she kind of looks kind of stern, and Grandpa said she had a, a pogamagon that she would tie in her belt. But if you've seen those, it's even Seneca, the big uh, wooden war club thing. And sometimes they put metal in it, you know, still, but she just had the war club and had it in her, and she would whack anybody that got, <laughs> got in her way. So I asked Grandpa, this uh, uncle, the same question, how come? And he was quiet for a minute, and he said she saw Indian War. So she would have been like 18 years old during Wounded Knee, and during the wars up in Canada where a lot of my f family's from. So that historical trauma that she saw and then being put on the reservation, um, handed down, and then she sent her sons, her four sons, to boarding schools. And then my grandfather, one of her sons, sent my mom to boarding school. And then on the other side, my grandfather went to boarding school and then sent my father to boarding school. So that's the historical trauma. So you talk about epigenics, he mentioned, epigenics was mentioned, someone should draw my DNA and they'll find historical drama. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't hug my kids, my two kids, or say I love them when they got a certain age. When they were babies, I just loved them up and loved them to death and you know, nursed them. I mean, I just, I was a big hippie, I almost named them Rainbow and you know. <laughs> so it, I broke the violent. You know, but as, so what is wrong with me? Well, of course, the counselors are not, they don't know anything about Native people. So we just talked about my mom and, the, you know, all that. So I don't know. But then someone said that, you know, we parent the way we were parented. So it's, I was never hugged and loved or said I love you. I told someone the other day, I said my dad was in a coma, dying, um, and couldn't hear. At the end. And then I, I said, I love you, Dad. <laughs> That's the only time I could, you know, so, yeah. So his soul wound, like I put in the essay, was when I showed him that video just before he died in the white man's image, I think was the name of it. 
and it talked about boarding school, it talked about Chamao, it talked about Carlisle, and it talked about everything my dad had went through at, at boarding school. And he just sat there with his head, in, his head in his hands and said, so that's what the goddamn hell they were trying to do to us. So it was only just shortly before he died that he figured out what the boarding schools did to him. And that, it just hit me like a ton. I mean, I, was, I couldn't even cry. It was, so that's his soul wound. So he lived all his life with unresolved grief and, and PTSD. So like was mentioned earlier, there was an attempted genocide. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, the scalps and so on, the killing of the buffalo. And now the boarding schools were the cultural genocide. So this is still new for me. What does healing look like? We look to our Canadian neighbors because they've, they have already worked through a lot. They have about 40 years in the Truth and Healing, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We haven't started the truth telling. So whatever this looks like at each individual community, is it a talking circle, um, retreats, or what, what is it? We have to ask the communities themselves. I believe in apologies. I, I saw what Harper's apology did for Canadians all the way across every province. I saw the tears. And what they said was it was a recognition of what was done to us, a recognition. Some of my people I interviewed said, I don't care for an apology. I'll never get my childhood back. But I believe the United States, churches, Quakers, can issue an apology. The church won't, the, the Pope already said no way in hell. He's going to Canada. There's still going to be pressure from uh, uh, the First Nations people for him to apologize for his role in the church. Anglican did. When I was up in, up in Whitehorse, I read the Anglican apology. And wh wow, it is an apology. They know how to apologize. <laughs> so that can be a template. Yeah. So they felt that they could come forward for healing. And there still is a lot of people that I've talked to that said their grandparents said they'll never talk about the boarding school. And we know psychologically, you're only as healthy as your secrets. So a lot of people died with with their secrets and alcoholism and so on. So the Aboriginal Healing Foundation did some, this is an incredible, it's a big thick report, but they, what healing looks like for my community may be different from Fort Yates. Mine is very Catholic. We could use a novena or church or whatever, but we also are Sundance people, Sweat Lodge people, Shake Tent, we're also Madei people um, that are with our tribal spirituality we would have two different kinds of ceremonies, but we can't just say, well, this will work for your community for boarding school healing. So much work to do is so, so I need to work with my own people to have, my cousins, he was talking to me about Wapton and his daughter went by, she's 42, she said, Papa, I didn't know you went to boarding school. So we need to do a lot of work with our own tribal people. And yet, we need to do work with you, you know? So we need a lot, we have a lot of work we need to do. We need to write, there is no curriculum. I think, is it Maine or Michigan has a boarding school curriculum? We want a national curriculum. And a lot more information out there. Professional healers. I'd, my psych, I, I, had, I had pneumonia, and my pulmonologist also happened to be a psychologist. I go, why did you do that for? I mean, two big degrees. But he was a psychiatrist, I mean. So I said, well, do you work with Native people here in Fargo? And he said, yeah. I said, do you know anything about boarding schools? He said, no. So that's just one set. It's like, pfft. you know, and you know the generational trauma, our kids, and so on. Um, so we need to look at professional healers, but we need Native people in those roles. So yeah, Indigenous healthcare practitioners. My people said, when I asked them, what, what would you see for healing? And they said, our language back, um, our ceremonies back spirituality, because we, we're not an organized religion, we are a spirituality. So that's what they're asking for, that's what they say they need. So at the beginning I talked about everything we lost, so it's trying to recover that loss. 
but decolonize and retraditionalize. So we need to decolonize ourselves. We're a colonized people, but we still sometimes, who is it? We still take on the traits of the colonizer and treat each other that way, horizontal violence. And only we can do that for ourselves. Only we can go in and retraditionalize ourselves. So I'm, I'm retiring in 11 days, but I've signed up for a two-year degree program in Anishinaabe language to relearn our language. Yeah, yeah. So, bonjour, Neiman Wayne, Dam Oma, Ayan. Happy to be here. I just had my final. I think I passed. <laughs> so we need to get started. Canada is about forty years ahead of us in truth telling. Reconciliation. The when I sat with the commissioners, they said truth is here, but. We ha it's going to take a long time to get to reconciliation because we have to do just what I had to do. I had to forgive my father. I went through a ceremony, and I said, now's the time I have to stop the anger and the bitterness towards my dad because it's, of course, making me sick. So one of the, at the White Horse, they, they, they were very careful in taking care of the survivors because of triggers and so on. So they even had paper bags that with all your tears, you could put your tears and there was a sacred fire outside. They stayed in the community a week after the, the hearings so that in case there was more triggers. So they, they knew how to take, they had psychologists, sociologists, medicine people, medicine women there to take care of the people that were, were telling their story. So he said, so there was one gentleman there that just, he just cried and cried and cried and his kids were there and they had never heard a story. So he turned around to them and said, I'm sorry, you know, this is why I am the way I am. And now I understand why my father was the way he, way he was in Mama. So that, that, we had to forgive ourselves within our own families. And so that's a long ways away from reconciliation. The United States isn't even at the truth telling yet. So. So I work with young people at NDSU, and when they stood up and, and talked about their grandparents' stories, they broke down and cried. So you can see the intergenerational trauma. They just, even though they're far removed from boarding school, it's still within our communities and within our families. Interviewed, and she was 76 years old, and she said that she had spent five weeks in a psychiatric ward because the memories at Chamberlain of the priest molesting her were coming unstuffed. She had never told anybody. And she even whispered to me in a huge house. She was whispering, no one in the house, but she whispered to me. And she said, I don't know why I'm telling you. And I said, I know why I asked. So with my dad and everyone, I didn't have the, the boarding school protocol. I didn't know to ask about sexual abuse because I thought that's such a taboo. You know, Indians don't do that. Oh, yeah. So I asked. So you have to ask the right questions. She said the five weeks she spent in the psychiatric ward, she never told her doctors that she was sexually molested in a boarding school. She said, what would they think of me? I'm a dirty savage. I'm a dirty Indian. And so she said, I don't know why I'm telling you, but I asked the question. So that's how I found most everyone had been, had been molested or, or seen it happen, witnessed it. So that silence and shame is still out there, very much so. I have two gentlemen that called and asked if I would interview them because then I leave, that, I leave the interview with them so it's sort of for their families to have or if they want their families to know what, what has happened to them. So when I go back after I retire on the 15th, I'll go down and, and interview them. I give tobacco. I give blankets and material. Uh, you know, Traditionally, when you ask something from someone, you, you give something back to them, and they're older uh, Lakota men. But they, they asked me. I stopped interviewing for a while because the last gentleman I interviewed was just a little bit younger than me. But he became suicidal, and he called me right back, and he was weeping. And I know the two young psychologists at the tribe. I have their cell phone numbers and got him help within a half an hour. So I quit interviewing because I didn't have, he was, it was a phone interview. I didn't have a way to reach out to him or be there with him or check on him and so on. So now I interview folks that are in programs of recovery or know about therapy and talk therapy and so on. 
But the, I, again, our boarding school survivors of that era are dying just like the Holocaust survivors are. And my, my survivors, they, my relatives now, they, they said, tell the world what happened to us. So I don't want anyone to ever forget. So I want you to go and tell people, tell your, tell your people, what can we do? Well, tell your people. Uh, when you see an Indian that's drunk on the street, I want to stop and ask him, what boarding school did you go to? What boarding school did your parents go to? And that's part of the legacy, the, the diabetes, because we had, my dad had ate healthy. You know, we had subsistence hunting and gardens and so on, and then they ate the slop, so part of where diabetes comes from. So sadly, my, my daughter, we are estranged. My son is good. He's, he's good. He understands. He talks. We talk. My grandkids, I've broke, completely broken the cycle with hugging and loving. My six foot four grandson is 25, and he just gets hugged up and loved up and kissed up. And <laughs> he knows. Kukum's coming. <laughs> so, uh, so I broke that cycle, along with you know, the beating and so on. But that emotional cycle, I couldn't figure out for a while. So all that was taken away from us, so we need to bring that back. So we work with the commissioners. They come down and meet with us whenever we ask them to, the National Boarding School Healing Coalition. Uh, they've told us not to do what they did, which was give money. Everyone, if you were in boarding school for 10 years, you got $10,000 for every year you were in boarding school. And then if you could show you were approved or whatever, sexually molested, you got up to a you know, quarter million. You had to work with the lawyer then, and there was a lot of issues around that. Well, we can't do that. They did a class action lawsuit up in Canada. We have statute of limitations, so that's not going to happen. So what we're looking for is community-wide wholeness and wellness programs. But you know, we need money for that, or we need a congressional action. We, we want Congress to go throughout the United States and take testimony uh, and then kick loose monies, but we're nowhere near that yet. We're still trying to do like what we're doing here today. So we had a Trilotin Healing Gathering, and that's uh, Geraldine's on the board, that's me in the middle, and then Christina is our executive director. So we just tried to do our own little healing for our community, and, and uh, we, had, we had what's called a wiping away of the tears ceremony. There must have been 150 that came, came down for our spiritual leader and went through our tribal wipe away the tears. You sort of you comb your hair, and you can put pretty things in your hair again like to get after your year or years of grieving and so on. So it was very emotional, but it was, it was also very healing. So I named it NABS. Uh, you know, I helped start this because uh, my father was nabbed. So that was pretty cute. <laughs> They always look to, okay, poet, come up with something cute. It's like, geez, wait now. I need to be thoughtful and think for a year. No. <laughs> so Gona also will come into a community and work with boarding school healing. And that's who was part of our, our community. So um, those are the references, and I, I have them run off. So if you want any of the references, but there's, there's a lot out there. There's not very many books compared to Canada has hundreds of books now on boarding school, children's books and so on, and I want to write a children's book of my father's story. And then well, hopefully my book will be out on October 2nd. Um, there's no other book of its kind that tells the full story of someone's life. Um, so I have hundreds and hundreds of more stories that would stand your hair on end, but uh, this is the end of the presentation. I can read maybe one more poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are asking about my dragonflies, which is part of my healing. So my first book of poetry is called Dragonfly Dance. So it, it, I'll, read a, the, I'll read two more. This is the title poem for this, and I'll read the title poem for Bitter Tears. How many of you remembered when the kids were killed in Red Lake? The boy went and shot. 
so um, something happened when it involved a dragonfly, dragonfly dance. Suspended above our plumed and feathered heads, the dragonflies joined us for grand entry at Red Lake. The sun striking flames from their sapphire wings, these winged mounts of our ancestor spirits returning to heal. I move and step with the drum. I dance with the dragonflies as one drops down to gaze into my face with its lovely bright eyes. I hold its gaze, this holy creature, spirit of the water, born of the water as I am. Life, birth, power of love made constant. She spins her beaded body to join the dragonfly dance as my wings join their rhythm, my feet vibrating. So this dragonfly dropped down and just, pff, it did something to me. So I have tattoos. And <laughs> but there's a lot. So I went on a journey to ask other tribes and other people, and I'll ask you what's your dragonfly story. So there's a lot of really cool stories out there about a native, native way. Every tribe has a story about this little sacred being. So I'll read the bitter tears, and then we'll talk. Bitter tears. The school's maintenance man drives me to the cemetery, unlocks a sagging gate under a wrought iron arch, stark letters, Chamawa Cemetery, 1886. Ancient firs tower above the graves, weeds and wildflowers cover the small flat plaques. Offering tobacco prayers, I gently sweep aside the weeds to read the names and years they died. What did they die of? Loneliness, worked to death in barns and fields, pneumonia, a beating from the gauntlet, suicide on the tracks in front of the school. I count 21 plaques in a row with the date 1918, the year of the flu epidemic. I find plaques stamped with the years my father was a student there. Did he know this boy, that one? Were they friends? As a carpenter apprentice, did he hammer together the casket they were buried in? Was there a funeral? How were their parents told? Sap seeps down a fir tree's trunk like bitter tears, its roots tugging at a plaque, holding a lone child in embrace. I brace against the tree and weep for the children, for the parents left behind, for my father who lived, for those who didn't. Minguich, thank you. that I wanted to go out to the villages and um, try to apologize. And somebody else suggested we need to go more slowly, but I'm feeling that the grandparents are dying and that we need to act now. I'd like to see the, a church apology more so than individual, is, if that's what you mean. And I think it's on your agenda to talk about that. Where, where would you be at with that in general? Is it something that you guys all have the power to, the higher ups to, I mean, it would be to me, it'd be the most, before I die, the tremendous thing to see, say this church, be the first of all the Christian churches to offer an apology um, to native people for everything that you've been hearing here the last two days. Yeah. There was something over here. So um, I'd like to hear more about some of the healing practices that have worked. And I'm wondering, because it's intergenerational, so does it need to be families coming together for the healing, or is it separate by individuals? Like, what, what has proved worthwhile? Yeah, I think just in general, just what I, I don't have any specific programs, but the programs that are working in Canada are the ones where they, there are families. And there are therapists that are specifically towards boarding school healing. Maybe elders that have been through boarding school talking to other boarding school uh, survivors. Uh, group therapy or talk therapy are, are the circles with the, the feather and so on. But I can't think of, I don't know anything specific. But just everything that I had said there, just the holistic way of dealing with, it's got to be community-wide is where we start. And yet we start with me forgiving my dad working it out with my kids, with my family, and, and talking more with my own tribe. So a lot of it is going back to our language, because within our language is our spirituality. There are so many words in our language that can't be translated, or the elders say they're too sacred to translate into English. Ceremonies, like the, the Sundance, 
uh, a healing ceremony, the sweat lodge healing ceremonies. Um, Sue will be the Uwippies and so on. Otherwise, it would be church ceremonies because our people are about 95% Catholic on my community. And yet, so many go both ways. They'll go to church and they'll go to sun, sun dance and sweat lodge. So it's bringing back our spirituality and our language, which is so tied together for all, everything that we lost. It's our culture that we need to, um, to re-traditionalize ourselves. I'm, I'm, when you just said that a very large percentage, I didn't quite hear, are today Roman Catholic, despite the treatment that they received at the hands of these supposedly very religious people who seem, from your tales, like torturers and sadists. Yes. Um, so how did, what's the, how do they resolve the cognitive dissonance between the church as religiously yeah. speaking to their yeah. spirit versus how they were actually treated by the... Yeah, what my parents went through, they still raised us kids Catholic. I walked away when I was 14. I just, I'm done. I didn't get hit or beat for it, but <laughs> they, I walked away. I, it's, it's interesting. What, what happens with a lot of the Catholic on a reservation is that they also strip the culture away, so they're not even aware of what happened. I was visiting with a gal that stood up and was talking. She's extremely Christian, extremely Catholic, and she was just in tears after this presentation, realizing what history did and why she doesn't know her culture because of Catholicism. The church is that the, the people that come into our community literally are at the pulpit saying, Stay out of that sweat lodge because that fire has a devil in it. Literally, I sat in because I was dating a guy I thought I was going to marry. It's like, oh, yeah, I can't do this. But yeah, so then the elders got together with the, because some of the Christian, the, the Catholic people too are a little upset at what they were saying. And we ended up almost literally tar and feathering him and getting him out. But there's others. We have a new sect of uh, Catholics in there. They're, they're gray robes and gray, and the nuns are back to their habit. And they're really tough really strict Catholic. So yeah, how do they, I, I can't do it. That's why I can say I'm no longer a Christian. I, everything I need for my spiritual being is within my tribal spirit. What God gave, what the creator gave us on this earth before 2000 years, before 500 years ago. And the elders always say, be sure and tell people we only worship one creator. We, it's all the same creator, different, you know, Kishkimanitu, uh, the great spirit is, is our word for, for the same creator that we all, um, have that relationship with. So I don't know. The young gentleman that spoke earlier, how does he resolve his Navajo? And I don't have that issue. <laughs> but others will say, well, you know, the, the cross looks like the four directions, and, but we're actually closer to the Jewish faith when it comes to, say, Jesus. We believe Jesus was one hell of a medicine man. We, we know he existed, and, but as far as the devil and hell and, the, yeah, the rest of, yeah. So I don't know. You have to ask them because I don't have that issue anymore. <laughs> yes. Um, it does occur to me that we need to develop healing ceremonies and truth-telling for the perpetrators, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. as Mark Charles was mm. talking about this morning, because we have to release ourselves in order to listen deeply. So we just can't go in and, I can't go in and listen from the neck up. Amen. I have to listen with my whole body. And my whole body has been traumatized either directly or implicitly or through the generations. That has, something has to happen with that. Mm -hmm. I you cannot do it alone. Uh, it has to begin. It's amazing what you've done for us. And I'm grateful. Thank you. So I know this isn't the, the maybe what you're talking about exactly. When anti-racism training when some of my students or white people come and say, well, I feel so guilty, I'm, and they're in tears, and what our trainers have said is to go beyond that guilt. So if you're feeling guilty right now, we don't need that. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do me any good. So go out and talk to your people about what you've learned here. If every one of you can touch 10 other people's lives, it will help us tremendously in what we're trying to do on a national level with reaching out to uh, about boarding school era. Yes. Well, actually, it ties in with that. I'm, I'm thinking that we're really what... Um, we need to do is to really have a conversation about what apology means, how it works in us, and what's important about it. But just going and saying I'm sorry right. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's what not. we've we've tried to talk about that. What is a sincere apology and what does that look like? So that we can't come up with that as a board. We have to you have to go to boarding school survivors and ask them what does a apology look like? And I think that's what the Anglican Church did. Because that's that's an apology. Yeah. Just to, just to add to that, um, it was our experience working with folks in Canada um, who one of the fellows uh, was was part of the Anglican Church, and he was actually a designated group of a group of people who were asked to go from the Anglican Church with this apology in hand, oh, okay. and they literally went where they were invited to go back to the different communities. And one of the pieces, if we undertake this work as has been said, we need right. to go in person. And what, what Jay said to us was, we can write all the papers we want. We can write all the minutes we want. But if we don't show up in person and say, we believe our words and we will follow through on them, then, then it's all meaningless. And he said it made such a difference. And they went with the idea that they would spend a, a few hours with the village or the community. And they spent days. They spent days because then they got to know each other. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that. Lou. I'm dying back here. I'm dying because I just want to just take a minute not to take away from your platform. I just want to introduce myself. Sego uh, Sego Guego. My name is Llewellyn White. I'm um, Chelsea Mohawk. And uh, Denise and I were, were chatting at lunch, and I'm consulting with the, the NAFs. There was an article, I think there was a copy on, on the front table, um, in which uh, my research is, is mentioned. Um, I've been doing for a number of years research on the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which is just that way, a couple of hours. Um, my grandfather, my father's father went to Carlisle, his brother went to Carlisle, several other family members, and 10,600 Native American children sent to, to Carlisle to write in the backyard. And many of those children from Carlisle were sent on outings, which has been mentioned here, during the summertime, so that they would be sent out to work in white homes, farms, domestic servants, etc., etc. So the work that I'm doing currently, I've, I've published a bit about my family's experiences at Carlisle, Right now, what I'm doing as a consultant for NAPS is looking for those children who died when they were on outings and they're sent. They're sent to work in homes and they die. They weren't sent back to their home communities. They weren't buried in a cemetery at Colorado, um, which has currently almost 200 uh, uh, grave sites of these children. So um, I, I started doing this research last year and it started with one Rosebud Lakota girl named Virtue Spottytail, who was 14 when she died. She was working for a Quaker family near uh, Byberry, and she is buried in Byberry Medium Cemetery. So that started with her. I now have a list of about 11 uh, names. So part of my work here in the here at this conference is to, <coughs> to try to you know, create some awareness and get some help because we can do this work from our side the work that denise does we travel we go to conferences we do our research it's emotional it's it's difficult it's hard but we can't do it all we can't do it alone so i'm here to ask for your help with some of this work that i'm doing i'm spending the entire week here traveling around going to cemeteries looking for these children that are lost. And there's at least three that are in Quaker cemeteries. They were working for, for Quaker families. And, and part of the work that we do when we talk about truth, truth is difficult. Settling the Settler Within is a, is a book that I suggest everybody read. And it's about, it's not to make everybody feel comfortable this work that we do. It's tough and it's difficult to look at our own histories and our own pasts and and, and what we're all part of. So, you know, I challenge you. If this isn't, you know, truth in healing, truth in reconciliation, it's tough. And there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of healing that needs to be done from, from all different uh, perspectives. But part of what drives me crazy sitting here is like, 
It's right here. Why what? isn't anybody at this conference talking about Carlisle and in Indian Industrial School? It's right down, right in the middle of the state. <laughs> that Quaker communities were a that part of. Us. <laughs> <laughs> there were many, many children that were in Quaker families. Libby Standing, who's mentioned, Arapahoe, she's mentioned in that article. She was with uh, Quaker families. She died. She's buried. They went way back year after year after year to get more children to work on the farms and in the homes. So that's what I mean. It's like, you know, that's the, that's the past that needs to be confronted and needs to be looked at really very quickly for that truth telling to lead to healing. So uh, I, I welcome questions or I welcome help. <laughs> because I'm going to the to the yeah. to the library at Swarth Four. I'm going to be driving out to different communities, and and, and I'm doing it you know, by myself. So I, I appreciate your uh, consideration and, and any suggestions that you might have. But it's it's tough work. It's really tough work that we do. Denise, it, you know, talked about intergenerational impacts, and 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 I experienced some of those very same things. So, you know. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Lou. Opportunities to converse with Denise and at least tomorrow with Lou abound. Take advantage of them. Um, we would like to present you, I would like to present our presenter, Ruth Ann, with our gift from Kendall Hill for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you to a grandmother from the north. <laughs> In our worldview of honoring the four directions, I'm going to give her a gift from the South. And I would like to honor all of us as we look from different positions, as we stand in one another's shoes or moccasins, we look from different positions into another place and we see differently. So we want to thank our grandmother from the North for coming to us. And we're going to give her a gift from the South which is cilantro seeds, which have been grown right here on this property. And I don't know if you do cilantro. I don't know if it grows up in the north. <laughs> it's cold. It, it might work on the kitchen window. I can do that. <laughs> and, and I've put on a little card here, um, the word for one mind. Because I know in the Anishinaabe tradition, they say the Thanksgiving address and as we each agree with each of the beautiful thanksgivings, then all together we say we are of one mind. And now our minds are one. So I would like to encourage us all from this place to look up into the north and honor our grandmother from the north and say, and now our minds are one. And now our, our minds, minds are, are one. Miigwech. One nishi, miigwech. Miigwech. They're trying to call me an elder in my tribe, but I say I'm a baby elder. So. Right. Baby You're grandma. Too young to be an elder, right? <laughs>